message tonight actually came from a single word that the Spirit gave me while I was driving my car, a single sentence, and it's in here, and I'll explain it to you later. Uh, but uh, the whole thing kind of built around that one phrase. And, and tonight is really much more of a reminder. It's a refresher. It's not deep revelation, if you will. It's, it's one of those messages where every now and then we just need to remember these kind of things. Uh, and what I want to talk about is kind of a follow-up to a message I gave two Sundays ago about truth, about truth. But tonight what I want to talk about is righteous decisions righteous decisions. Righteous by definition uh, in the Greek means observing divine laws, upright, virtuous, and keeping the commands of God. Righteous is to be observing divine laws, upright, virtuous, and keeping the commands of God. So I want to say as an opening statement here uh, that none of us are fully sanctified yet. Agreed? Good. Jesus was fully sanctified. I don't feel like I'm fully sanctified. I feel like I'm still learning what it means to be completely set apart from evil and completely dedicated to God. So my disclaimer to start this is I want you to know that I recognize I don't always make righteous decisions. But I think we need to have that at the forefront uh, for very good reasons, because I see a major struggle going on in many people's life because we've lost the value of making righteous decisions. We've lost the value of making a right decision. I'll I'll tell you what that means in a minute. Uh, We make decisions really based on our feelings instead of what is right and making Uh, righteous decisions, I think, has almost become a thing of the past because righteousness is no longer valued. Feelings are valued over righteousness. And, And I think you can see this in our society where it's more important what you feel than what is right. It's more important what you think you know than what is truth and rightness. Uh, And so righteousness is based in decisions that are made in truth. In other words, every righteous decision has to be a decision that was made in truth. It can only be a righteous decision if it's made in truth. And we defined truth a couple weeks ago as anything that emanates from God. So if I'm making my decisions in the things that emanate from God, I'm making righteous decisions. So the converse is true. When I begin making decisions outside of that that emanates from God, I'm wandering into the territory of unrighteous decisions. So if we make decisions that are not based on truth and they're unrighteous, God blesses, hear me out, God blesses righteous decisions. God blesses righteous decisions. The fruit of an unrighteous decision is a negative consequence. So if I make an unrighteous decision, there will be a negative consequence. When I make a righteous decision, then God is pouring out a blessing for the righteous decision. Let me give that to you scripturally. Psalms 512. For if it is you... (laughs) For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. So God blesses and surrounds with favor one who would make righteous decisions. And the converse is in Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress truth in unrighteousness. You with me? I mean, when we start talking about righteousness versus unrighteousness, unrighteousness was the reason that Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. If you look in Ezekiel 28, 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you until observing divine laws was no longer important until being upright was no longer important until being virtuous was no longer important until keeping the commands of God was no longer important. 
And I want to make this statement, and we're going to probe this out in our own lives. I think the enemy of righteousness is rationalization. The enemy of righteousness is rationalization. We can often miss righteousness by determining what to do based on our feelings, emotions, our wants, the heat of the moment, and our rationalization. It'll get you in a minute. In society today, we are putting an incredible emphasis on feelings. An incredible emphasis on feelings. So whatever we feel is elevated above anything else. You hear statements like this. You're not allowed to offend me with your beliefs. My feelings are more important than your beliefs. Actually, you don't have the right anymore to openly disagree with me because it hurts my feelings and then I'll need a safe place to go to. That was just a little sarcastic right there. (laughs) Can I just say this? Sometimes I need my feelings hurt. Sometimes I need somebody to speak enough truth into me that I feel like I got a spanking and I can get my way corrected and go forward. And it's okay. It's okay to me to find out that I've elevated my feelings above righteousness and somebody needs to come back and say, that ain't right. So that I can come back down to righteous decision. And I think society is now even dictating to the believer what Christianity is. I want you to think about this. When society begins to tell us, the believer, what Christianity is. If you judge what I do, you are a hypocrite because they understand Christianity in a way that, well, (laughs) you can't point out my sin if you have sin. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Society can misinterpret the Bible and then use it against the believer. Things like, oh, you guys say homosexuality is wrong, homosexuality is wrong, but so are tattoos and mixing fabrics and clothing in the Old Testament. But they don't understand that that is the mixing of the world and the church that's being talked about and that it's symbolic. And so they don't understand scripture. Why? Because Christianity is spiritually appraised teaching. You know this from the book of Corinthians. It's foolishness to men because it has to be spiritually appraised. And we're in the seat to spiritually appraise it. And the world is telling us what the definition is. And the world is telling everybody else what the definition. I hate to say it, but the Christians are not standing up to tell the true interpretation of the scripture. So they would understand the tools they are using are not effective when it comes to understanding God. It's like telling your mailman it's okay for you to perform heart surgery on me. The reality is he's not equipped or capable of understanding heart surgery, but we'd say go ahead because he found some neat facts. I want to stand for a minute on this topic of rationalization because I think it's really huge. I think it's huge for all of us, me included. If I can rationalize a reason for doing wrong, it can seem like it's okay. And we say that again. If I can rationalize my reason for doing something wrong, it can seem as if it's okay. Most rationalization is putting my feelings above righteousness, and it needs to be okay to do what I want to do so I can do what I want to do. So I have to find a way to make it okay for me to do wrong so that I can make it okay for me to do it. Is that making sense? It's a lot of I do's in there, I know. If I can give you a good reason why I do things wrong, you might agree that it's okay for me to do a wrong thing. Let me give you some examples. And this is not meant to offend anybody, but it's a true story in my life. I knew a couple. And just being factual, the spouse of the couple was extremely overweight. Extremely overweight. And one day I was talking to the other half. I'm trying not to be in the male-female thing. 
I was talking to the other half, and we were actually talking about ice cream. We were just having a conversation about flavors and all that. And it gets mentioned to me that this person's spouse has a bowl of ice cream every night before they go to bed. And I thought, wow, that's kind of unique. And I didn't want to say maybe that's contributing to the weight. But I was asking, why would you have a bowl of ice cream every night before you go to bed? And he said, oh, it's, it's really simple. Growing up, her father, <laughs> sorry, growing up, her father didn't allow any desserts in the house at all. And so what she tells me is she is making up for all the desserts that she missed out on. <laughs> now, I'm not being critical, but what I'm saying is, what she is saying is, I would be willing to damage my health to spite my father. I see it a lot like this when it comes to rationalization. Uh, you got a car and your car gets 15 miles to the gallon. And so you decide, I need to buy a car that gets better gas mileage. I, I can buy a car that gets 25 miles to the gallon because I go 1,500 miles a month, and at 250 a gallon, that's going to cost me $250 a month. So I want to go buy a car that gets better gas mileage, one that gets 25 miles to the gallon. So when I go 1,500 miles a month at two and a half a gallon, it only costs me $150 a month. Look at that. I saved $100 by getting a car with better gas mileage that I took out a loan for and I pay $381 a month for, and my net is actually $131 less. Why? Because you rationalized the fact that you just wanted a new car. And you used the gas mileage as the... <laughs> some of you are like... <laughs> <laughs> and those are kind of secular examples, if you will, of, of making a decision that's not the right or best decision based on a rationalization. Because we say things like this, I deserve to be treated well, and my spouse does not treat me well. So having this innocent affair on the side is okay. It's just sexting and flirting and God's going to understand because he knows how my spouse treats me. And the reality is, you want to be wanted by someone, but you're not willing to work on the current relationship. Now, let me just say this. There are marriages that are hard and hard to stay in. And sometimes you have to leave a marriage, but leaving a marriage should never be because you had an affair. Not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to look at how we rationalize because we believe that we deserve things. I deserve a bigger house. I deserve a nice car. I deserve an expensive vacation. I deserve respect. I deserve love. I deserve a high salary. I deserve to have my boss's job. But let me tell you something about the word deserve. By definition, the word deserve, by definition, is to do something worthy of a reward or punishment. To do something worthy of the reward. So the question is, how are you justifying that you deserve something? In other words, what did you do that was worthy of a reward? What have you actually done to deserve that more, to deserve that greater? Because most people have let society tell them they deserve things that they've never earned or done something worthy of. Okay, let me put it to you this way. How many of you have watched TV? How many of you are lying about watching TV? You are, you are, you are. Okay, so eight, nine people lying about watching TV. Okay, awesome. I watch TV and I hear a commercial say to me, don't you deserve the best? You deserve the best, so you should buy our product. And I'm looking at the TV thinking, how would you know what I deserve? I may be a total jerk and a total bum, and you're telling me I deserve the best when I don't deserve the best. 
I've done nothing worthy of that kind of reward to have the best. So maybe what we've done is we've gotten the word deserve confused with entitled. I'm told I should have this, so I think I deserve it. Other people are getting it, so I deserve it too. Other people are wealthy, so they should give me their money because I deserve to have the same happiness they have even though I didn't work for that money like they did. Oh, that could be political. (laughs) The truth is to deserve something, you have to pay the price that makes you worthy of that reward. And sometimes that's a big price if you think you deserve something big. I'll give you another example of where we rationalize things. A few years back, we were going to be doing a revival. Uh, and and a, a man who was part of it came to us and said, hey, I want to speak at the revival. And we said, well, maybe we can work that out. We've got several speakers, so we can give you a slot in there the whole bit. And somebody calls me up and says, are you going to let that guy speak at the revival? And I said, was there a reason I shouldn't? Well, other than the fact that he's shacking up with his girlfriend, so I went back to him and I said, hey, is this true? Or are you living with this girl? And this was his response. Well, see, she's divorced and she gets income from her ex-husband. And if I marry her, she doesn't get that income anymore. And with that income, I can be in full-time ministry. Now, here's the weird thing. It made perfect sense to him. Why would we give up the free money? We just call ourselves married and we take that income from the ex. And all I could see is you don't want to work to provide for your own family. You want to take the free money and then call it ministry money. Ouch. I see so many couples today rationalize living and sleeping together outside of marriage for financial reasons. Why pay two rents? Why don't we just keep it to one? It's expensive to live around here. Listen, it's still an unrighteous decision. And listen to me, unrighteous decisions have negative consequences. Maybe not today, maybe not next week, but I'll guarantee you God is faithful. Okay, we will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And if you sow unrighteously, you're going to reap negative consequences. Unrighteousness is easy. It's actually the easier decision of the two because righteousness is tough, but there is always a blessing in righteous decision, and there is never a blessing in unrighteous decision. It will always eventually crash and burn. I want you to listen to these three scriptures. Psalm 1820. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. Proverbs eleven eighteen. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. Proverbs thirteen twenty one. Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. God is looking to reward righteous decisions. Matthew 6.33, we know it. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things get added to you. It stuns me today how many people make an unrighteous decision and then want to come to counseling and ask me, why isn't God blessing me? Because you're living with her? Because you never should have gotten that far in debt? Because you wanted more than you could afford? If you're making a decision that is not in line with the righteousness of God, you will not be rewarded. And unrighteous decisions typically come from emotionally made decisions. Wow, if there's anything I can leave you with tonight to say, take this with you, is unrighteous decisions typically are emotionally made decisions. We get our emotions all wrapped into something, and we make a decision based on how we feel, and it's often not what is right. This is why someone can get married to a person before they actually know them. This is why we can put it on a credit card before we consider how much the payment is going to be. This is why we can commit to ministry before we realize how much time it takes and end up getting burned out. This is how we end up in bed with someone we shouldn't be in bed with. 
It's how we become abusive and ruin a relationship. They can say things that are damaging to the relationship when you're in the moment. This problem has actually been around for a long time, emotionally making unrighteous decisions. So we're in really good company, okay? I've done it. You've done it. We just got to begin to think about my emotions when it comes to my decisions. Let me give you some examples. David made a decision to have an affair with Bathsheba. What was his emotion? Lust. Saul made a decision to go into battle instead of waiting for Samuel. It cost him his entire kingdom. What was his emotion? Under pressure. Peter made a decision to deny Christ. Why? Fear. Moses made a decision to strike the rock instead of speaking to it. Why? Anger. Jonah made a decision to run from his call to Nineveh. Why? He hated Nineveh, didn't want them to repent. Ananias and Sapphira made a decision to withhold profits from a land sale. Why? Greed. Wanted to hold some for myself. So when I use my emotion to get involved in the decision, I can often make an unrighteous decision. Now hear me out. God didn't create man, put him in the garden, and then Satan come in and give him emotions. Our emotions are God-given. What we have to do is be in control of our emotion. And I'm not saying don't be emotional. I think being emotional is a sign of the love that's in us, of the passion that's in us. I think emotions can be a very good thing. But oftentimes, when we're in an emotional state, we're more likely to make an unrighteous decision. We know what a godly decision is. We just want to rationalize our situation so that we can do what we want, what satisfies the emotion of the moment. But that rationalized decision won't be rewarded. Doing the right thing is often harder, and the results take longer, but the reward is greater. And doing the right thing often is a matter of waiting until the emotion has passed before you make the decision. So here's a huge advice alert. I need a yellow sign that blinks over me. Advice alert. This is the thing you write down. Do not address a problem with someone until the emotions have settled. It's the number one battle in a marriage is I'm saying things when I'm frustrated and upset instead of stopping and thinking, I would never say that to her if I was not frustrated and upset. I would find a better way to do that. And you would think the number of times I've made that mistake over and over and over would teach me, stop, settle down, get your emotions in check, and then address it with a real thought-out answer or response. It'll help you avoid a real mess. I don't care if it's at work, if it's in your marriage, if it's with your kids, if it's with the person in the car in front of you that you bumped into. I say it to married couples this way. When they come in for counseling and things were a mess in the marriage, you cannot make a marriage decision while you're in the tornado. Because you're flying around in a circle getting hit by two befores. There's too much chaos. There's too much mess. There's too much frustration. There's too much anger. There's too much hurt. And it's just swirling all around you. And you're trying to make a good long term decision for the marriage. You can't. You got to find a way to step out of the tornado and say, that's the mess. What's the best way to stay out of that mess? What's the best way to calm that storm? I got to get out of my emotions for a minute and I got to be able to make a good, solid decision. So I'm going to end with this. When it comes to making a righteous decision, righteous decisions come from the things that emanate from God. So when we can have a baseline of the things that we know are of God, we have a baseline for making righteous decisions. So I just looked at kind of our society today, things going on in our society where we're going to have to make some decisions. And I said, okay, if we could know truth and a righteous place to make that decision, maybe we can make a more righteous decision. This would be one of them. The borrower is slave to the lender. The borrower is slave to the lender. 
That's a truth. Any sexual activity outside of marriage is unrighteous. I'm telling you. If you want me to marry you and you come to me, I am going to ask you, are you sexually involved with each other? And after you tell me, yes, I'm going to ask you for how long? Because for however long it is, however many months it is, it's going to take you that many years to get things lined up to be in the way that God would want them to be sexually in your marriage because you've abused what he gave you. And so there's a repentance process that has to take place. And there's a process of going through getting that sexual life straightened back out because you've got it tied in a knot by getting ahead of things. Let me just say this. Pornography is an unrighteous trap of the enemy. It will pull you in, drag you down, and take you places you don't want to go, don't need to go, and it will create a mess in your life, in your marriage, and in your personal thinking process. Here's another one. Biblically, if we are able but unwilling to work, then someone else shouldn't take care of us, including the government. If we are able but unwilling to work. Another righteous thing for society today. God designed women for men and men for women. Here's one that's been around a long time. Lying is wrong. (laughs) It's just wrong. It's just wrong and you will always get caught. And the worst thing about lying is you will always have to lie to cover your lie. And then lie to cover the lie that you lied to cover the lie. And then lie to cover the lie to cover the lie to cover the lie. How about this one? Loving money will bring about all kind of evil in your life. How about this one? Murder is wrong. It's ungodly. Maybe this. Disagreeing is not hating. Disagreeing is not hating. It's where I learn. If you agreed with me on everything, you and I would never learn anything. But if we disagreed on something, then I could learn something in the process. But if I choose to disagree with you, it doesn't mean I hate you. It means I disagree with you. And we're going to search for unity so that we can come into an agreement. How about this one? If God said it, it's truth. It's truth. I have to base my decisions on if God said something about it, that's the baseline. That's the truth. And maybe uh, maybe two more. Know your facts. Know your facts. If you don't realize how much garbage the media is feeding you, know your facts. Know your facts. Because some of the stories you're being told that have been propagated for years are just flat not true. Like what? Like the amount of abortions that are actually being done because of rape, incest, or the mother's health. Minimal. Fractional. Last one. We, you and I, will overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You have a testimony. The Bible says that your testimony is so important that you can overcome the devil with it. What is my testimony? That I was lost. That I had sinned. That my relationship with God is forever broken. But one day, I learned that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died on a cross in order to exchange my condemned status for his righteous status. I became righteous before God and he became condemned before God on my behalf. And if I would put my faith and my belief in that, that I could stand before God hidden in Christ and be righteous before him and the enemy no longer had any rights over me. And because of that testimony, when I put my faith in that testimony, the enemy can't mess with me. You can try. 
but I see him. And I use my testimony to do battle against him. Stand to your feet, please. I'm going to ask my prayer ministers to come forward. This is what I want to close with tonight. We as a people, as Christians, as believers, we need to make righteous decisions. And maybe you've made some unrighteous decisions and you just like to have someone else pray with you to break that decision, to turn it around, to give you the opportunity to repent of it and move on from it. Or maybe you would like to be encouraged to make righteous decisions because you're in a place where it would be easy to make an unrighteous decision, but you really want the Spirit to come and lay that truth on you so you can make a righteous decision. Maybe you've got decisions coming up that you're going to have to make and you just want somebody to encourage you to always be looking for truth. Maybe you want someone to pray over you right now to give you a revelation from the Spirit so that you could define what is the truth in my situation. Maybe you're in that tornado and you're flipping around and getting hit by two befores and you just need somebody to grab you and pull you out of that thing and say, I just speak peace over you for a moment so you can see it for what it is. Whatever that is, I'm going to pray and close tonight. And I've, these folks are up here to pray with you. And I I say this almost every Sunday, but I think it's critical to say, please, please don't get to the parking lot in your car and think, I should have asked somebody to pray about that. I should have asked a brother or sister to pray with me about that. I should have asked for prayer to get clarity on that because they're here and they're ready to pray with you. So Father God, I thank you tonight for just the simple reminder that righteous decisions are based on your truth and you bless those. You bless them. And we're going to be tempted to make an unrighteous decision and it's going to come with a mess. I pray that you give us wisdom to make righteous decisions. We want to be yours, submitted and committed to you. Thank you just for the reminder, just for the simple refresher to think about our decisions and make sure they're righteous. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit, that you could ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.